Ollie. Ollie says he doesn't really remember the beginning of his story. Says he's glad about that. It was a tragedy, he says. And when things like that happen, your mind blanks out. It's like your mind knows, he says, how to take care of itself. Before he was one of my best friends, he was a baby with green eyes and a bright red afro, left outside a Texas church in a basket with a note pinned to his blanket. Please take care of this baby and love him like crazy too. He used to take the note out of his pocket all the time. Now he keeps it stored away in a plastic bag, the paper inside yellowish and ripped on one corner, too delicate, Ollie says, to show anybody anymore. We all know what came next in the story, Ollie says. He can't remember. A preacher and his wife found and kept him. Loved Ollie just like the note asked them to do. Then the preacher died and it was only his wife, Bernadette, who's Ollie's mom. Bernadette, who comes over sometimes to drink coffee with my own mama, and sometimes, if it's a Friday night, one glass of wine. And more than that, Bernadette says, and I forget my own name. Even though she said that a hundred times, she and Mama laugh anyway. Allie looks at my dad sometimes with those bright green eyes like he's deep in a dream of remembering his own father living. Ollie, who my dad used to call my son from another father and mother, which always made Ollie duck his head to hide how red his face got, to hide how big his smile got. Ollie says he doesn't really remember the story of being a baby in a basket, but sometimes the story lives inside his eyes when kids ask, what are you? You black or white or Spanish or mixed? And Ollie has to shrug and say, maybe I'm all those things, and maybe I'm something else, too. Once, when Ollie told my dad about kids always asking him this, my dad just gave Ollie a fist bump and said, you know what you are, Ollie? You are 100% you. Rap song. Make me a rhyme, little man. First day of school, first grade, Beastie Boys blasting from the car radio. We're driving home, me with my lunchbox, open on my lap because my after school snack was always what I didn't eat at school. Grapes, carrot sticks, apples and peanut butter, whatever. I dug it out, sitting in the back seat of my dad's car. September sun shining in on us. Mama home or maybe visiting the grandmas. So much I don't remember. So many places where there's white space where memory should be. And some days I wonder if my own mind is still going like my dad's. But that year he was still daddy, still playing ball and driving me from school whenever he was home. Make me a rhyme, little man, my daddy said, glancing through the rearview mirror at me with my mouth full, but my head moving to the Beastie Boys. And then I must have swallowed, must have said, my name is Zachariah and I'm on fire. Can't go no higher than Zachariah. You got skills, son, my dad said. Yeah, I said back. Yo, I know. I think I got them from you because you're Zachariah too. Unbelievable. The first time my dad heard one of my songs, he asked, who wrote that? We were in the kitchen and it was pizza night with extra cheese, extra sausage, and lots of olives. I was singing because of that. And I was singing because it was summer and because the pizza smelled so good and the whole day was only for us. No coaches calling, no practice, no game to study, no fans. Just me and my daddy, mama in Arizona visiting the grandmas. So it was just us men and our pizza and all the rest of the takeout we were planning to have with mama gone. So I was singing about all of it, the summer, our bright yellow kitchen, the good food, and me and my daddy alone together. I don't remember how old I was, but I remember my daddy's smile. You wrote that? And me with a slice almost to my mouth, stopping and saying, yep, it was all made up by me. And then going back to singing a song about pizza and summertime, a song about all the good things already here and the good things coming too. On my daddy's shoulders. I was on my daddy's shoulders when crowds gathered around us, pushing autograph books, t-shirts, and scraps of paper into his hands. I was on my daddy's shoulders when a band marched through Maplewood, playing a song someone wrote about the speed in his step and the power in his hands. I was on my daddy's shoulders when the TV ran their interviews with him recounting the plays of the Super Bowl game when the guy on the other team let the ball fly right through his hands. I was on my daddy's shoulders when the crowds grew smaller and the coach said, maybe next game you need some rest, then looked up at me and smiled, trying not to stare too hard at my daddy's shaking hands. The first time, again. I used to be a tight end, my daddy says, laughing. But what I really wanted to be was a wide receiver. Now I'm just wide. The first time he said it, we all laughed, even mama. And she usually just smiles when something is funny. The second time he said it, I said, it was funny the first time, dad. The third time he said it, I said, you always say that. No, I don't. This is my first time, he said. 
Stop messing with me, Daddy. No, you, my Daddy said. Stop messing with me. My Daddy never shouts, but he was shouting. My Daddy never cries, but he started crying then. Tears. My Daddy cries every day the year his father died. He tells me this time, this each time I scrape a knee or stub my toe or watch a really sad movie and try to hold back my tears. I cried the whole year, my daddy says, 365 days. But I wasn't born yet, so I didn't see it. And two years later, when his mom lost her leg because of the disease called diabetes, my dad said he cried because he didn't have the money to make life comfortable for her. You know, he said, a fancy wheelchair, ramps, a new house where she didn't have to pull herself up on her crutches to reach for everything. And two more years later, when he signed his first contract, my daddy said he cried because he could buy that wheelchair and that house and help his mother and his sister move into it together and see them cry happy tears. But some days now, my dad sits at the window, silent tears moving, slowly moving down his face. I don't even know when his tears started. I don't even know when they're going to end. Real Fiction on Saturday mornings, I read novels about stuff like guys running or playing ball or just being with their friends. Realistic fiction. I don't know why it's not just called real fiction or why I don't want to read anything else anymore. It's like, I like that it's real people, real stuff happening to them in real time. In my books, nobody jumps off a mountain. Nobody bounces back up to the top. Nobody can fly or cast a life-saving web across the city. I wish, but life doesn't work that way. Today I'm reading a novel about these kids who live in Harlem and get in some trouble over a science project. Something about their faraway life and different kinds of problems makes the stuff happening around here seem like, I don't know, feels like anything can be kinda okay in the end. Maybe. That's why I like realistic fiction. Real problems that real people could have and the stories not always ending with some happily ever after. But still, most people seem to end up okay. Race day. Yo, ZJ, it's race day. I'm lying in bed watching the snow come down, but jump up quick when I hear my daddy. Yo, ZJ, it's race day. Throw on my track pants, sneaks, and hoodie before I even brush my teeth. Used to be me in a jogging stroller, my daddy pushing me all over Maplewood. Then me on my scooter trying to keep up with him, but now we mostly run together. It's one day a year we race. It's Sunday, and this is the year I'll beat him. I know it. This is the year I yelled down the stairs to him, you ain't ready. Don't say ain't, my daddy yells back. And I already am ready. You the one up there getting, still getting dressed. I run down the stairs and he's standing in the doorway, bending over to touch his toes, then stretching his arms up and over. I stand behind him and do the same thing, bending left with him and right with him and over and up with him, the two of us, the way we've always done. And then we run. Down Valley to Baker Street, Baker to Ridgewood Road, then Cypress with him only a little bit ahead of me and the air leaving my lungs coming back in cold. The snow turning to beads on our faces, mixing in with the sweat. I can hear my daddy's own breath coming hard as we turn at the golf course, make our way back. And that's when I kick a sprint at him, take off with the air stinging my cheeks, my smile as wide as anything until I hear him coming up behind me his size 14 shoes crunching in the snow, his laughter, the soft sound I've always known. You thought you had me, he says between breaths. And then he's gone. Kicking the dusty snow up and yelling back over his shoulder, one day, ZJ, but today is not that day. I keep running, though, because the day feels regular and regular feels cold and good. I keep running fast and hard, just a little bit behind him, already thinking, I'm going to win this race next year. Tackle. One time, me and Ollie were in my yard playing tackle while his mom, Bernadette, talked with my mom inside. Ollie tackled me so hard, my head hit the ground and my nose bled. I ran inside with the blood all down the front of my shirt. Ollie, running beside me, saying, I'm sorry, ZJ. I didn't mean to bust your nose like that. I'm sorry. After that, both my mom and Bernadette said, if they ever saw us playing tackle without helmets again, that's all they said, but we knew the rest. My dad probably holds the Football Hall of Fame record for the most concussions, even with a helmet on. I don't think Mama really likes football, but she won't say that. Just says, I better not see you playing without a helmet. Just says, why don't you and Ollie find another game to play? Just says, be careful. Just says, I love you, ZJ. Brain, body, brain, and soul. Maplewood, 2000. The sky on the radio said the world was going to end when we got to the new millennium. 
that it was going to explode, a whole nother big bang. But this time, instead of the earth being created, it was just going to bust into smithereens and all of us would be gone from here forever. December 31st, 1999 came on a Friday. So Ollie, Derry, and Daniel were all staying at my house. A little bit of snow was falling and we were in my room listening to a Prince CD, playing that song 1999 over and over again. Derry was dancing. Maybe one day we'll see him dancing on TV. He danced over to the window, looking up at the sky, waiting for some sign. I asked him if he saw anything that looked like the end of time. Nope, he said, just snow. And maybe we were a little bit scared that it was true, that this was the last night of all of our lives. And maybe we were a little bit excited for some kind of explosion. We were only 10 then, and I guess when you're a little kid like that, some part of you believes that no matter what happens, you're going to be safe. If the end of time comes, Daniel said, we had some good years together. I'll always remember y'all. We didn't even know what was coming. We didn't even think it was strange that my daddy was in his room with the door closed instead of in his chair in the TV room watching videos of football games. But when he came into our room and started yelling about the loud music, we all froze. Who are these boys anyway, he said, frowning at Ollie, Derry, and Daniel, who he'd known practically forever. At first, we thought he was kidding. I said, Daddy, stop playing. And then he said, do I look like I'm playing? And left the room, slamming the door so hard, the whole room shook. After that, we all just went to bed. Didn't stay up to say Happy New Year. Didn't try to wait to see if the world was going to end. My daddy had never yelled at us kids. So in some kind of way... The world, as we'd already known it, as we'd always known it, had already ended.